Okay, so I am going to start sharing my screen and then I'll go over some introductions and get started. So yeah, uh, I'm Rohit Goswami. I'm a doctoral researcher at the University of Iceland, uh, Reykjavik. It is nice and sunny here. It will be sunny throughout the entire session and most of the day. And um, so I'm in the Faculty of Physical Sciences. I do a lot of uh, high performance computing work with molecular dynamics and quantum chemistry. And uh, my helper for today is uh, my sister back in India. Um, she's uh, Amrita Goswami. And, and uh, Amrita, do you want to introduce yeah. yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, I'm Amrita Goswami. And like Ruhit said, I'm his, uh, I'm his sister. And I'm a PhD student at uh, IIT Kanpur. And um, I work on molecular dynamics. Uh, well, OK, so. I work on ice nucleation primarily, and uh, I've used Nix with Rohit. Uh, we, we've used Nix to write um, scientific software together. So uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this session. OK. So a couple of things. As I just put on the uh, etherpad right now, and as I'll show you around for a few seconds, uh, I actually was kind of split on how to deal with this. Uh, I would like to know in the etherpad, first and foremost, how many of you are planning to uh, follow along? Oh, yes, yes, very importantly, Python or R. Because uh, later, but even before that, possibly, uh, will everyone be follow, following along? Will you code along? Yes, no? Wonderful, I, lo I love that energy. Yes, we'll try. Okay, fantastic. Because, uh, so initially I wasn't sure whether I should split it into the more traditional, so well, okay. Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. So what is Nix? Well, a quick Google search will tell us that Nix is a whole ecosystem. And in fact, the standard approach to Nix, which you'll see in uh, possibly if you've looked into this, but okay. Anyway, so let's start with some slides, okay? So we'll start with some slides and then uh, I see overwhelming support for Python. Thankfully, I did set up a kind of lesson with Python today. Just finished it a while ago. So we're, we're in good shape. Okay, so I'm going to, by the way, just to check, my screen is visible, right? Not just my browser window? It is. Okay, fantastic. All right. So, uh, full disclosure, this is actually uh, based off a presentation I have given before uh, for CS106A. There was a code in place initiative and I gave this uh, presentation there, but there was only one attendee. So I am reasonably certain I can get away with giving this again. So yeah, and it's been expanded with my sister's help. So, okay. So, um, before this, let's let's maybe do this. Have you heard of Nix? Yes. Okay. Okay. So then, actually, let's start from the Python point of view. So the first thing is, let's uh, dig deep and throw some shade at the current Python packaging system, okay? And uh, this is all in good fun. You know, I, I use Python a lot and uh, whatever programming language you use is perfectly fine. They're all great. But let's let's look into this a little bit. So, you know, a, py, a .py file is a simple module. And if it only depends on the Python standard library, then if you've installed Python and you have a .py file, then you're good to go. Works everywhere because Python installs more or less everywhere, right? So if you have a pure Python package, then uh, all you really need to do to get to that, you know, all you need to do to make a package, a pure one, is just put an in init.py with those, uh, those double underscores, as many of you might know, is called a dundle. And you can use it. If you need to go beyond that, 
right? Like say you need um, something from the system, then you can use setup tools with a setup.py, which does more complicated logic. And, but even then it's relatively simple. You have a source only file, which you can then distribute, okay? And this, by the way, is a very simplified view of, uh, th there's this very nice uh, YouTube video on uh, Python packaging. By the way, the slides are on the GitHub repo and uh, feel free to, I mean, I would actually encourage everyone to go and check out the references after this, okay? So this is what's called the Python gradient. So wheel, so the kind of wheel Python packages are ones where, um, you know, you need to do some extra setup. Like if you've ever installed NumPy, then you'll see it unpacks a lot of things, wheels as they're called. And in fact, it looks like cheese, you know, there you go. It says cheese on the right-hand side. And of course, um, okay, maybe before that, let's, uh, sorry, give me a second, I'll pull up a Jamboard. Recently, I've been teaching a lot of uh, younger kids and I've realized that I really like scribbling. So I will probably scribble for you guys as well. So maybe even before that, Many of us know what a computer is, right? I mean, a computer is, you know, it's a logic device, it has an ALU, it has a CPU, it does addition, subtraction, it does a lot of things. You can say a lot about computers. But when you talk about how, especially in Unix machines, well, actually everywhere, when you talk about how packages exist and how they're installed, well, then really your computer is a filing cabinet. And why would I call it that? Well, um, on your computers, for those of you who have tried the shell before, uh, you might already be familiar with this. Otherwise, it's okay. There are variables which, uh, so quite literally, if you're looking for a program, so say you want to know where your program called, um, let's say I want to check out a program like Vim. You can do which Vim. Well, in my case, I'm using NeoVim. That's, that's not important. But this path here, so the computer knows where this, this package is, right? And well, sadly, the computer isn't all that smart. The way it knows these paths is because it literally, um, it has a path variable and it searches for it. And in fact, this is how, um, maybe this will be clearer where I've actually modified the path. This is how all libraries and all binaries are uh, found by the computer. This is how you use anything. And this is actually true in uh, most operating systems. It's just that, okay, so for example, and well, you know, this is a next path, but if you want to link a library, so when you install a library, uh, by the way, so for those of you who have never had the experience of seeing this, if you install something from source, that is, if you do, you know, um, the standard setup is to get source and do configure and make. And if you don't do make install, or if you give configure a prefix and you install it in, not, not in the system-wide installation, then um, let me try to show you what that looks like. So do you see this bin doc share lib? Okay, and by the way, this is the exact same structure which you have uh, in root. Okay, so if you go to your root directory, you'll see the same bin share, you know. And perhaps, I, I don't know how many of you have known this, but if you install something from source, typically uninstalling it is a lot more trouble. And the reason is when you, when you hit install or when you do make install normally, it just copies the contents of these folders into the system-wide location. And that's typically why you also need zero. Or you can, you can actually manipulate your path variable. You can manipulate this guy. And as you can see, I have severely manipulated this. I have a whole bunch of directories. So what is the point of that? Well, I'm trying to say that for the computer, when you compile a package, you know, this is your nice little package. 
then you have to place it somewhere in path or in another well there are actually a bunch of these but the the actual names are not that important but as you might imagine so for library files dot so files there's like a library path and you can pass all of these to compilers and this is how this is how you actually tell the computer where things are okay now what does that mean for us though like why did i even go into that well one of the reasons why i went into all of that is how do we work with uh, say these general purpose pip install sort of setups right i mean it works fine in some cases but the wheels don't always work they're prepackaged and they're binaries and uh, well they're not exactly binaries but they don't always work on arbitrary distributions so <clears throat> By the way, uh, are there any questions about this part? Um, I'll pause for questions. I will also probably give you guys a break one hour in for like five minutes, if that sounds like a good plan. But that's much later. If you have any questions until now, you can uh, unmute yourself. I'll wait for 10 seconds. Have a sip of coffee. So what goes wrong really? Well, if one package depends on another, then you need to first install one, then the other, and you know, keep track of all of these packages and therefore keep track of the provenance. And this is what most package managers do for you. I, I recently had the horrible experience of having to install a bare metal from scratch system where I did not have a package manager and I had to do all of this by hand and it was a nightmare. No human being should do that. And Nix really wants to save you from that. You know, the idea is uh, Nix, so, okay, on the, on the left-hand side are uh, two academic uh, papers. And this was actually, this actually came out of a thesis by um, one of these people, these fine people here. And the idea is, it, it comes, the, the basic concept is from here. Every time I I make a package, right? Every time I make a package, what if I was to put it in its own folder and I was able to give it a unique name? Right? So that um, let's let's say in this case, let's let's say we, we use color to denote that. So that every time I wanted, say the red colored one, no matter um, if it's to be called after the green or before or any kind of thing, I'm guaranteed to get this set up. Um, I don't know if that's a very clear way of doing this, but if you maybe look at uh, the figure on the right, which is actually from their docs, um, I don't see why I haven't put that here, but uh, you'll see that on the rightmost side, there's this thing called the Nick store, which basically has a cryptographic hash and the uh, and the package name. Okay, a quick aside, this is not all that new of a concept in some sense, like it's a great concept, but uh, for those of you who have ever used um, the module system on an HPC, for example, then you might have seen um, modules which uh, you can, Typically, your uh, HPC itself will provide them, but you can also make some modules of your own. And let me show you how that looks to give you an idea. Um, yeah, so if you make your own module, then you will actually declare some variables and literally manipulate the path. That's how, you know, because as I mentioned previously, the path is how the computer knows where to find things. Now, there's, there's an issue with this, uh, and that is, there's still a person involved. So how, how does this setup work? Okay, maybe I'll, I'll describe LMOD for a second, which is more intuitive in a sense. So, so say I have some source and I extract the source. Um, yeah. 
what I need to do. So I have extracted something. I go into it. I do um, configure with a flag. So let's say in this scenario, I'm going to install something into this home.hpc folder. Okay. Um, I'm going to do make and make install. What, what do we expect will happen? Well, what's going to happen is um, if this box represents uh, home.hpc, there's going to be you now a little bin, shared, lib, depending on what this package came with or what kind of package it is, okay? So this, this is going to be generated. Then I'll say, well, you know, if I want to know where, where this new package something is, then I'm going to have to add, say, the bin directory, which has a binary which we can run to my path. So I will add it to my path. But then, and, and in fact, you can, you, can, um, you can imagine, if you will, that I can do this n number of times with n different packages and keep installing it into this same .hpc folder, the same root. So in some sense, I'm making a pseudo root directory because uh, I call it pseudo root because I'm in control of this. I have uh, executable permissions and read write permissions. And clearly in the situation which I'm talking about, I don't have permissions on root or maybe I just don't want to mess with the system root. You know. Okay. Now, there is a problem with this setup though. Um, for, first of all, I, I want to know if everyone is uh, keeping along, like do I, should I go back and re-explain something is something, because so this is kind of like a built up sort of, uh, it, this part is a bit conceptual, but we'll get to coding in a minute or so. Uh, is, is everyone keeping up? Uh, should I repeat any part of this? Have a sip of coffee and Okay, so the problem with this setup is, uh, well, what if I have conflicting uh, requirements? What if somewhere in my dependency tree, two different packages needed two different versions of the same library? So, you know, there was, there was something already in lib and I needed another version. Well, then I'm in trouble then this format does not work very well. And what would be the solution? Well, in the module system, the solution is then to install each of these to a separate folder and add that to the path separately. And then you can bash script this, or if you use LMOD, the uh, um, LMOD system on HPCs, then that uses Lua scripting. But you might imagine this is still not very robust and it's still, the, the onus is largely on you, the user, so while this works, this is the equivalent of saying, I can't help you with your dependencies. You have to make your own dependency tree every time and install it in the right order. That's kind of painful. And Nix does away with this. Okay, so what Nix does is it, it has a package manager, Nix, and it, it stores it by default. Uh, in this talk, I'm not going to have time to get into how to install Nix in a non-root location. It is a nightmare, and I would not recommend it on my enemies, so I will not go into it here. Not, not that any of you are my enemies, but I'm, I'm just saying, you know, it's not fun. Um, so Nix, by default, uh, generates a hash, a cryptographic hash. I don't exactly remember if it's an SHA hash or not, or, so I'm not going to write that and the package name. And it does this for every single uh, package. And what's more, it keeps track of, it keeps prominence, uh, provenance of this. It has a store, it has a variable store. And in fact, this is what is being shown in this, in this picture here. As you can see, there's the Nix store, which uh, if you notice, mimics this entire directory structure, which I was talking about, yeah? then uh, you have user profiles. And each of these profiles then is linked to, so, so you define. So you might wonder here, 
well, how do I know which one will I get? If I have 10 Firefoxes installed, how do I know which one will I get? And um, really, that's the entire, that's why there's a whole Nix ecosystem instead of a Nix package, singular in some sense. So why would we do this? You know, and, and actually this slide probably says it much better than I have uh, throughout this. So Nix protects against cell phone. You know, it, it protects against the problem where you have unidentified collisions, say 60 packages down the line. You have hand compiled and hand installed 60 packages and then the 59th one has a collision with the third. And, and then what do you do, reinstall everything? So, well, I mean, in order to do this, it leverages uh, the concept of functional programming. We're not going to cover, okay. Uh, the standard approach to learning Nix or teaching Nix is that you dive right into the functional programming aspect of it. You say Nix is a functional programming expression language and you go from there. We're not going to do that because this is a carpentry con thing. You guys are here for a skill up and we're going to learn a useful skill today. That is useful. The standard approach is useful, but it just takes too long. And each package is technically in isolation, which means, okay, so the isolation thing is super important because it means you can uninstall them without, without having too much trouble. I mean, which is great, really. And it enforces consistency. So there's a store hash name version. And this consistency, okay, so in one sense, it reduces the choice of the user. You know, I mean, I can no longer say, oh, install it in .hpc slash hash something. Oh, well, I can, but I shouldn't. We're not discussing that. But the idea is by taking away that choice from the user, you gain a huge number of things. For one thing, now, if my hash is the same, and I know it's in the same store because it is by default in slash nix, then something with the same hash name and version is unique. And if it's the same, then I don't need to rebuild this anywhere. I can use a binary cache. Uh, we might get into cachex today. And, you know, in, in other words, we save the effort of compilation with a guarantee. Okay, now uh, we can actually start programming immediately. Uh, I would suggest rather than copying out these, it would probably be easier if you guys come to uh, this post, this particular post, which has these. Uh... Oh, okay, there's a question. Wonderful, great question. Ah, I was hoping to see this question. Fantastic. Okay. So, to discuss, it, the question was what is the difference between using a virtual environment and uh, Next? Well, okay. Let's consider a scenario like. Um, Knowing what we know about Nix, that, that it has a binary cache in some sense and things are reproducible, what does that mean for us? Well, suppose I have two projects, you know, project one and project two, and they both happen to use matplotlib. And, you know, I'm, I'm a standard, well-adjusted programmer. I know that I'm not supposed to use uh, the system pip, so I'm going to make an environment. Note that it doesn't matter what kind of environment you make here. You can use Conda if you feel like, you can use poetry, you can use just plain old virtual end, anything, okay? But recall that if my second project requires um, map.lib as well, same version, same everything, and you know, uh, let's let's say I even have a nice little common requirements.txt, and it's just that P2 has some more than P1, some extra things. So this wasn't a problem. So honestly, I I found this to be a major issue when I started working out my laptop more than my home PC. But you know, the problem is each virtual environment is going to have its own little. So say you you put them all in venv. It's going to have two copies of matplotlib, right? It doesn't know that, that if it's the same version, it can just maybe reuse the same matplotlib. Because um, none of the existing dependency management systems or none of the existing Python ecosystem, no part of that ecosystem 
allows you to uh, reuse components apart from the system one. Like, sure, you can you can globally install it, but then you you lose all the benefits of a virtual environment. And so, space is one reason. And another thing, which will become more obvious when we when we start actually using Nix, is well, suppose I want to bring in my editor. I like Emacs, and wherever I go, I want to use Emacs. With just a virtual environment, I'm a Python virtual environment, I can't bring in Emacs, for example. I, so even though I have the same Python dependencies, I'm unable to bring in external packages, generally. So uh, does, does that answer the question? Right, so Conda Link does, okay, so Conda Link does a lot of stuff and in my personal opinion, like Conda in general does a lot more than it should, than it needs to, because uh, the Conda dependency resolution is not as, uh, it's not as good, I would say, as the Nix one, because it doesn't actually detect a lot of collisions in some cases. I have personally tried, like, you know, of course there's Conda Forge, and you might argue that Conda Forge does allow you to install things which uh, do not even, um, which are beyond Python as well. But uh, this is maybe more of a personal choice. So the other common comparison with Nix, and uh, I'm sure someone might have thought of that as well, is Docker. Okay, so, so maybe, maybe let's formalize this. So there are typically three major, um, three major things which people think about in this space, okay? And those three things are uh, Conda, because for one thing, I don't like Conda because it's proprietary. I mean, that's that's just me, but okay, anyway. Uh, so there's Conda, there's Docker, and the argument against Docker is simply that A, you require root constantly. The Docker, uh, as you know, the Docker user group is um, equivalent to root and giving you root access. And uh, B, Docker containers are a lot heavier than Nix uh, environment because Nix is not actually setting up an environment. Okay. So may maybe I should clarify that. Well, okay, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, it, is, it is useful to actually mention this right from the offset, that Nix manages this entire problem of you know, collisions and make and install and configuration and all of that, but it's still installing it on your system. Okay. It is not spinning up a virtual container. There's no container service. And uh, even though there is a Nix daemon, we, we'll see that in a second. There's an extremement that that exists so that you can do concurrent builds. It, it is not, uh, so nowhere do you actually need any virtualization or anything. And also, again, personal point, I find, uh, I actually like Docker Compose quite a bit, but uh, it's a little bit wonky when it comes to removing caching, I mean, dealing with caches, especially on uh, BTRFS, the butter file system. I don't know if you guys have seen it. But uh, yeah, ah, yes, okay. So yeah, these, these are excellent questions. Uh, slightly different compilation requirements. So all of these are getting to the point where we might say, I would like to be able to describe, okay, so, oh yes, by the way, this might take some time. So if you guys, uh, those of you who want to follow along on this, uh, on this page, if you could run this uh, first command. By the way, is this visible? Is it, is it clear? I could also switch the theme. Is, is this clearer? Why is better? Okay. Yeah, so if you guys could uh, run this particular command, it might take a while and you will need root for this. And uh, yeah, you can't run it as root. It'll, it'll complain if you try, but it needs sudo. And what it does, okay, so the reason why I, I prefer the multi-user one is so that uh, normally, in fact, you know, this might not be so surprising. If you install the single user one, then you, um, then concurrent builds don't really work that well. So instead there's a Nix daemon and it operates in the standard procedure, um, kind of like any standard HPC queue. It takes jobs and from these build users and runs them as and when it can, okay? Okay, um, and this will actually, 
this is the one which is going to take a while. So this command is not in this particular uh, page because it's actually, I'm going to just put this here. Uh, yeah, this is this is the <clears throat> and in fact, uh, you might also need to since I have Nix already, um, and I do believe I've run this command before, so it should be faster for me. But uh, let's let's find out. Oh yes, yeah, so this is oh my god, I haven't run this command before. Great, this is going to take me a long time too. Good, good, okay. Mm. Okay, now, a couple of things to note about this. Uh, first of all, maybe everyone should try this as well. And we will, we will do the checks which are mentioned in the slide. But before that, what, what you should notice is that a lot of these are simply being copied they're not actually being built on my PC. And so it, it probably won't take all that long. It's only going to, this is standard package management stuff. As an aside, um, on my HPC where I don't have root access, I did monkey patch the source and built it to think uh, .nix in my home directory is root. And there it builds everything, every time from scratch. Because because it's not uh, it ca it can't copy it off the binary cache. Oh, there we are. So yeah, we are. Um... And just just to so everyone should like satisfy themselves that this works. And uh, I will point out that my in general I do not. So the Python version is different. It is um, with the next command. Let's, let's go over this. Okay, so this is short. A lot of things are happening here in shorthand, and we will break this down with the make shell um, shim after this, the make shell function. But uh, maybe off the bat, it's understandable that we're telling it what packages we want. So uh, the way Nix is structured, there's like um, the Python packages under a separate namespace. So there's like Python 3.6 or Python 2. And we're saying, so I want Python 3.8 with packages. So this, this is actually a dummy variable. It could be anything. And if, uh, and if I had not put it like this, then I would have to put it manually here and here. Instead, we can simplify this a little bit by um, putting this dummy variable here. So we're saying with p, and now p is considered to be attached in all these um, arguments. Yeah. And we're doing the run to ensure we're going to get the right. Um, so this is not always required, I should. Yeah, but in many cases, like especially as you, as you might notice here, um, for those of you who have used PyN, you might know that it actually, in a really hacky manner, uh, it, it does this whole shim system which manipulates your paths, your bash paths and your ZSH paths, your shell paths basically, um, to, to do this because it's sim links to whichever version of Python you want. So the way around this, the simplest way around this is to directly pass it a run command so that it, it is going to run the next one. I, I could also equally have told it to give me the, um, so when I'm in the shell, well, okay, like again, maybe this is not going to be there for everyone. Okay, so. Okay, so Let's, let's actually wait for everyone to get this first command done. Then we'll go into the different forms of this command. Okay. Maybe a straw poll might be fun for this.
sure if you guys could uh, vote as in my other. Um, should we move on or should I give it a few more minutes? Ah, okay, Nix and Guix. Okay, yeah. Um, so Guix is a spin-off of Nix, which is more geared towards uh, running X11 programs. And I believe this was more of a historical divide because, uh, so Guix actually split off, I think, slightly even before Nix OS. So back then, Nix was very uh, anti-X11 from what I recall. Nowadays, there's not all that much difference, but, uh, you know, in fact, while we wait, yes, let us check it out. I'm pretty sure the GUIX project mentions their provenance a little bit. Hmm. Am I confusing this with something? Um, are people waiting on the poll, by the way, uh, other than me? Ah, okay, they use a Lisp-like language. Hmm. You know, I'm actually not going to be able to answer that. Other than the fact that the syntax is, of course, very different. I do see quite a lot of similarities, to be very fair. I mean, um, hmm. would, would, um, Ah, okay, yeah, the whole Turing, uh, so uh, let me, yeah, okay, so Nix is a DSL and it doesn't, it's very proudly a domain specific language. Um, it does not care about being Turing complete or um, being a well-known established language. Like this is, this is really like uh, more of a design, you know, it's like one of those not a bug, it's a feature sort of things. <clears throat> own little DSL, the next, yeah. <clears throat> oh, oh, okay, I see someone. So the, uh, how old is your old version? Is it like uh, V1, like one, one of the version one ones? Because, oh, okay, something on, so, so let's, uh,
on sim is to install the hello uh, package, which, as you know, gives us a nice friendly greeting. And uh, so what, what are we capable of at this point? We can run next search and uh, do something with it. And in fact, you know, it's going to look exactly like a screenshot. And uh, so I, I was really thinking of more like giving an introduction to how I personally use Nix in projects and how most people use Nix in projects using uh, what I feel is not typically covered, the make shell system. So the, the virtual environment part of it really. So um, yeah, so one part of this is that, you know, the you can follow this along, you can follow along with this if you're interested in this or maybe come back to it later. Okay. Uh, Nox is basically a better package management system. It's really just Nix and dash I and then whatever package you need. In this case, we're going to start out with Nox, Niv, and Laurie. Okay, so um, Niv is going to be for pinning dependencies. And okay, so in order to understand that, let's break down this thing a little bit. So you'll notice that we're moving from this, this sort of one-liner to um, this thing. And we're doing so in order to gain something naturally. Everything is for a purpose. So, <clears throat> okay. So this line is telling it where to get the Nix packages from. So what, what the Nix packages are is each Nix package is a derivation. Each derivation, we'll actually build a few of these ourselves. Each derivation is going to look like um, okay, no, these are not. This is the shell. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. So each derivation basically looks like this. And uh, so really what, what happens under the hood is that uh, by default, you'll be set up to track one of these branches. So master or unstable. And uh, so you're just saying here that um, import all these function derivations. This is super important as we'll see in, the, in a few minutes when we want to have this in a more dependable manner. Okay, now there are a couple of other things which we're doing. Okay, so the entirety of this tutorial is more or less to get you guys familiar, guys and girls, with this, this function, okay? And this is really my favorite use case. I know that a lot of tutorials focus on using Nix to build packages, but uh, realistically, I rarely build packages with Nix as a first step. The first thing which I want is a good environment. So we'll be focusing on make shell. And uh, so the let in syntax is just, so you define variables here and you put them in here, yeah. So um, you can start by defining um, a Python environment. Notice that here we're saying 3.5, which means Python 3.5. With packages is just syntactic sugar. This is the same um, dummy variable which I mentioned previously. You'll notice that here I have not used uh, with yes. So uh, this is considered to be the more, um, the less confusing version because if you're doing a lot of stuff inside these uh, functions or if this is very big and you've done a with yes or with something above, it can get confusing. But uh, that, that's not a concern. We can do it, write it anyway for us. And the main point is when we run this, when we run this make shell function, right? Then we're going to be dropped into an environment. Okay, let's let's now discuss the types of environments, okay, which we can get with Nix. Mm. Let's build these up. Um. Okay, let's let's just start with this one. This is a more fully defined environment. Okay, 
A couple of things are happening here, but we're not going to get into that yet. I'm going to start by disabling the end because we're not discussing that yet. Okay. This is uh, my standard Python. Then I can do a shell. Okay. If you pass pure, the pure flag ensures that uh, you only get what's defined in your shell. Okay. Um, and you know that that does cause some issues, but it's also super helpful when you want to get away from your paths and everything. The only issue which it really causes is that uh, you are required then to define everything which you'll be using. So if you're going to be using uh, ZSH or BAT or anything else, you have to define it. Well, in this case, okay, so in case anyone is wondering, BAT for me comes through a ZSH plugin manager. So that's why I didn't need to define it. But uh, if you're comfortable doing this, then I would suggest always going with pure. Because uh, really, you, there are no downsides to doing it this way in, in some sense. So that's the two kinds of environments. OK, without pure, uh, if you get into an impure environment, then uh, that means that you don't you're not guaranteed to have, um, so you know, here I am back with my shim which is not great for me. So those are the two kinds of environments. Okay. And uh, in fact, yeah, that's this uh, slide. So, and th this is uh, another example of what is going on inside Nix. So you define all your instructions and metadata. You'll notice here, we are mostly relying on inbuilt functions. We are um, assuming knowledge of this with packages function and we are not yet, not as yet, doing any custom configuration or anything else, which um, some people were wondering about. Okay, so uh, there's a little aside here. We, it's not really all that relevant, but uh, you can use Nixon shell scripts. You just need to um, change the um, shebang a little bit. So if you call Nix shell, and then you can just use a Nix shell command here. You, you can actually, in fact, um, call shell.nix files here as well, okay? <clears throat> and uh, this is simply the answer to the previous point, which is that we're going to use these three packages a lot. And maybe after this entire thing, you might want to think about the other parts of the Nix ecosystem, really, which is uh, there's the Nix packages, which I've discussed a little bit. Hydra is a build bot, Nix OS is an operating system, and I'm not fully certain what Nix Ops is, but I think it's a DevOps thing, Never mind. And there are some helper tools which we'll look into, but they're not, they're not really best practices. We're instead going to deal with best practices for now. And what are they? Okay, let's, let's move ahead. Okay, so. <clears throat> What I was trying to get at before this, before I switched into what shell you get, what purity you get, and all of that. Um, oh, yes. Uh, so make shell is the environment which, which lets you create. Uh, it's, okay, it's one of the commands which uh, gives you an environment. You, can, you don't necessarily have to use it, but it's the most friendly one. We'll see uh, why in a few seconds. There, there are shell hooks and other such nice things. But uh, one of the things which I wanted to point out when, when I drew this little thingy here is that this actually defaults to something on your system, a channel of the upstream repo, okay? And you might think, think wait a minute, how dependable is it then, really? Because you update Nix and then you updated everything and then all your derivations will rebuild. So it's not really all that dependable, yeah? Like, same problem as any old operating system like Arc. I, I'm on Arc, I like Arc Linux, but uh, yeah. So one thing which you could do is you could make your own fork of this. And uh, yeah, you don't do this now. And in fact, don't ever do this unless you have a really good reason for maybe, maybe if you want to run a set command on the entire Nix packages repo, then, then do this. Like if you want to disable checks for some reason. So as such, you'd never want to do this, but perhaps it should be obvious or it should be clear 
that you could just uh, make a clone of this entire repository. You could edit the files in this repository. And so NixN, the environment installation which we were using, allows you to pass it a flag which will tell it where to get the derivations from. So basically where to look for derivation. That's what the F flag does, okay? So, you know, and as is mentioned here, we will almost never use this in practice. I say almost never because there are, in some instances, a good reason why you'd want to fork it. Uh, for example, like I said, if for some reason you want to disable all checks, like if you were installing it without root and you have to rebuild everything, so. But by and large, that's a rather hacky method because then you're in charge of making sure your packages are up to date. It's, it's a lot of maintenance. For, if it was for one package, I would say really that, that doesn't sound very nice, okay? So what should we do instead? Well, we should use NIV. NIV will, um, and in fact, you know, I wrote out these commands here so that we can just stare at it here without actually running it. Um, because, okay, NIF takes a little bit of time. One of the first one just takes a while. Um, okay, so compared to globally tracking the branches of Nix packages or even local changes in forks, it's always better to use uh, something a little more deterministic. And what that something is, is NIV. And what it does for us is when you run NIV in it. Um, okay, so the second command just switches the branch. You tell it what branch of the Nix packages repository to use. So you're saying update Nix packages branch this. Then at this stage, you know, you will see it has created a, a directory Nix and under that there's sources.json and sources.nix. Now, what do these contain? Well, let's, let's find out. Okay, yeah. So in a nutshell, it looks like looks like this. And it is, what it says on Latin, it is basically a description um, right down to the hash of the comet as well as the uh, cryptographic hash of which version, what thing you're using so that uh, it should be clear that this is going to be more reproducible. Now, um, that's the JSON file. The other file which is generated is simply a helper um, let me open that up. So it, we don't need to read into this too much. All it does is it allows us to use the sources in the JSON file with some error handling, okay? So um, how do we use that? Well, we'll actually, so before that, how, let's make a template for um, the shell.next. Now, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with derenv. I'm just gonna ask that here. Um, oh, wow, I have been illegally doing things. Okay. Maybe, maybe we'll just stick to the pluses and minuses here, or pluses, or not. Okay, so derenv is a, a shell helper. What it does is, oh, fantastic, yeah. So derenv is a, is a little shell helper. What it does is it uh, simplifies your life by, um, you can define things which will run in that folder. Okay, maybe, maybe it's best to show rather than tell. So if I go to, um, yeah, so if I have a .envrc file, and uh, you'll notice here that I do have such a file, I have I have this file called uh, .envrc, which you can write, it's a, we will write some, they're fairly simple. Then, uh, and if you've installed derenv, I believe it's in Go. Uh, yeah, so if you've installed derenv, then, and if you allow it, then it simply handles your path a little bit more. So the whole game is to get the computer to be smarter about paths. It's to make this filing cabinet of yours find things magically. 
or make it seem like it's finding things naturally. So in this case, you'll notice that the end has exported all of these things. If you're wondering, couldn't you have just written a shell script and then sourced that? Well, yes, you could. That is exactly what is going on here. But then you'd have to make a cleanup script and all of that. So Diren just automates this quite a bit. But Diren does not play by default very nicely with Nix. And if you think about this for a few seconds, then you might understand why, right? Because Nix, the Nix shell may or may not have Diren. Right, so that, that is not necessarily going to help you. So you can't just evaluate the Nix shell immediately with the end, or rather it could not be useful to do so. Instead, what we can and will be doing is we'll be using this thing called Lori. So Lori, I should have given a link to it. I'm sure I did somewhere, yeah, okay. So Lori basically has two parts. It has, um, it has a systemd component, which uh, basically builds the script in the background. And maybe this little GIF is nice. Mm, well, okay, no, we, we'll just go without it. So what it does is, um, so you'll notice that my nvrc in this case just said eval lori diren, yeah? And uh, this is coupled with uh, a system CTL command, a system D uh, command, which will automatically build our shell. So every time we make a change in shell.nix, it will, um, yeah, so one of the other things is it's very verbose. So even though you might say, hey, I don't like Twig, it's a, it's a commercial company, I don't like them, I don't know what they're doing, and I don't want to run their arbitrary command. Well, you know, um, the good news is it will tell you exactly what that command has done. It just spits out a lot of information. And you will need to run the daemon um, and allow it with the ramp. Note that in this case, you are going to get an impure shell. Like I, I should, uh, I should maybe mention this here later. But uh, you'll notice that you will get an impure shell. By the way, though, though that's not really part of this, I would heavily suggest investing in finding. Um, a decorator component, like there are some bash frameworks which do this and in ZSH there are definitely many, uh, which will give you a little indication of what your system state is. And it's super useful in more cases than one here, you'll notice it tells me I'm using system node and Ruby. So, you know, I mean, it's not part of this, but I would highly suggest you use something like that so that you know what kind of shell you're in, for example. Mm. So you'll notice it tells me I'm in an impure shell. And if I disallow that, maybe you may have seen this before, but uh, just to own it in, it's gone, I'm not in an X shell. And if I demand a pure shell, then I'm in a pure shell. So it, it should be clear that like uh, these, these errors which are showing up are because uh, in the pure shell, I have not installed these. So there is literally no SSH agent, there is no PS. There's no nothing. So this is something you should keep in mind. But okay, yeah. So we have set up nev, we saw what that did. And I'm fairly certain this used to expand correctly. Ah. Uh, I'm going to try my local host for this. Huh. Very strange. Is it because of the theme? Nope. Okay. Some other problem. I'll fix that later. That's not important. Okay. So, uh, and how do we use these sources? Well, it's uh, it's not that tough. So you 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 ask it to import the sources.nix file, and then um, from the sources.nix, you in, import that version of Nix packages. So all we have done is we have said instead of um, instead of this here, where we were importing the global global Nix packages, we're now importing the uh, Nix packages which are dependent on sources.json. So sources.nix consumes the sources.json. And uh, we're now importing that. This is very optional. So 
we, we won't discuss that further. And uh, yeah, that's the first two parts, right? So we have covered until now what kind of shell we can get and how we can get a dependable shell. Now, now we'll be moving to the more interesting part. And uh, it's a good time to maybe take uh, two minutes for more questions or a break. And then we'll move into actually customizing make shell. And that's where we'll do things like install new packages, build new packages, you know, all kinds of magic. Okay. So, um, sure. Right. So, if everyone is back, then should we continue, or has it been not been five minutes? And I wasn't really keeping track. Well, wait is the default, so I'll just wait for some people to say yes. <clears throat> yes, I'm going to say how people that maybe not be in the computer are going to write, wait. <laughs> yeah. Ah, yeah, some of these installations take a bit of time. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, but until now, we're still mostly playing around in the realm of you can look this up and you should look this up. Like I, I highly suggest, like we, we'll get to that at the end. But uh, now we'll go into some more abstract things, you know, I mean, things which we really want to do and which makes sense for us to be able to do, but are maybe not that well defined. I mean, okay, so maybe at the outset, I should point out that uh, I am not very good at functional programming and I will not tell you all to go through the Nix pills or other such things in order to use Nix. It is good. It's certainly something you should do later, but just for using it, we shouldn't need to and we don't actually. So uh, I'm still gonna see, we're not ready yet. Huh. It, it works for me, so it's probably your browser. Yeah. Huh. Well, okay. I mean, thankfully, at least the local host is working here. So. So while we wait, uh, David, do you want to say something about GUIX? Because I just realized I completely misunderstood what GUIX is. <laughs> so yeah, do, do you want to say something about it? Uh, that I use it <laughs> and I don't know how. <laughs> Does it so also my Yes. Um, so I think it's very similar to Nix in terms of a, a package manager. And you can also load the different packages you need in the same way. However, I haven't got too confident to using it because I don't understand either Nix or Wix properly. I find it more attractive because it's not a DSL language. Like it, it's a language, right? So you don't have to relearn something new. Um, no, not because it's doing complete or not. It's just because it's more familiar as a. Have you have you done a lot of list programming in the past? No, yeah. but still, it feels more natural. <laughs> it's, it's but again, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not an expert.
I mean, uh, I know they're working like there's a new thing, the Nix wrapper, which allows you to build and test, uh, you know, commands and all of that. But it's still, yeah, I mean, it's definitely not at the level of, say, proper language. But uh, I find the syntax kind of nice once you get used to it. Uh, I don't know if we should wait any longer. No, I, th I would say that you start because we've been already 10 minutes. Yeah. All right. So let's move on to um, certain features of make shell, which makes it attractive to us. So um, the first thing which we're going to be doing is we're going to be seeing that uh, oftentimes, so one of the reasons why we use direnv is so that we can get, so that we can inject variables or paths or anything, run programs. Now we can't use direnv, okay, now, some of you may be thinking, why can't we just pipe commands into the next shell? And, and we can, but that's a bit of a, a awkward way to do it. And then you'd also have the onus of passing along your direnv file, your nvrc, and that's not ideal. So instead we will, um, and we can define basically a little shell hook, which is just bashisms or zshisms or basically shellisms, if you, if you will. And uh, the way to define it is, is uh, so the let in syntax is really one of the most important things that you'll need to remember. And in fact, it's all you need for any arbitrarily complex environment that you want to set up as we'll see. And the hook is quite simply, we'll define a string and we'll put all our little export commands here. And then at the end, we will call it inside um, make shell like so. Now, um, oh, and this actually, okay, the other reason why I put this here, because you might be thinking, hey, that's not that important, really, but it, it shows a pattern which we'll be using again and again. We want to keep the, the arguments to make shell as terse as possible, okay? We don't want to, like, ideally clutter make shell with uh, a lot of this gunk, really. So the idea is to define a lot of things in the let section and then just pass it to make shell instead of doing it in line in some sense. Okay, now here's another more like a pattern. If you want to change flags, okay. So the first thing which is super important when you're working with Nix and presumably with the uh, Gwix or one of these guys that we're only going to talk about Nix, unfortunately, is you will want to take a look at how it's implemented upstream, okay? So say for example, if you, um, so there are ways to deal with the phases, but in general, nine times out of 10, you can get away by just going to the actual package and staring at it. So what does that mean? Well, if you want to override a global package. Now, in my personal experience, I have found that uh, when I want to override a package configuration, it's normally not at a per project level. So sure, I'll want to override a lot of Python things, but if I want to disable tests for say lib uv in one project, it's pretty much going to be a system issue, which is why I've done it. At least, you know, that's what I found. So there's a little aside here um, into your global configuration file, which is this thing called mix packages. I mean, it's in config, the xdg config path, if you, if you will. And uh, you'll need to define the package overrides and then uh, again, this was just the syntactic sugar which prevents us from writing packages here and packages here. And we, we use this syntax to keep the rest of libuv the same. Why? Because, well, libuv might be complicated. So let's take a look. Not all that important for us right now, but uh, okay. The the idea of using override packages. Oh, here it is. Yeah, is that we don't want to. So we could have overridden the entire derivation, but then we'd be in charge of getting all the um, phases right. Okay, so one of the things which Nix does by default is uh, you know this is more of the syntactic sugar which really helps you out is it, it has a series of phases which it runs. And typically there's like a configure phase, a patch phase, 
all the standard phases of the Unix system. Yeah. When we do override att attributes, then we really keep the rest of this. You know, we keep all of these, and we're just overriding a particular one. You know, hence the name. That's really all we're doing here. We're saying the package called libuv. I'm just going to override this attribute. Now, maybe, like maybe everyone agrees that this is more elegant than say making an entire copy of the entire Nix packages and making a fork and then going here and changing it here. It's not pretty. This is much neater. You know, I know what I want to change. So this is how you'll pass flags. So if you want to compile a program with a different flag, then you might configure, um, say you might want to override pre-configure, for example, yeah? Or, or in one case, which I have actually done, uh, autogen, that was horrifying. But okay, we can find that later. Yeah, so in, in one particular case, I needed to, um, there was an R path issue with uh, Autogen on my HPC. So I actually had to remove um, temp folders from it. And uh, yeah, so I had to remove this. So in that particular case, I did not write this whole thing. I had to go and copy the contents of the post install hook and just add the part which I wanted to. In that case, okay, so the, the model of this story, the model of this part of the story is, it's a good idea to take a look at the upstream package configuration, because if I had just done old attributes and changed the post install hook, then I would have lost all the upstream configuration. So that's something to keep in mind, okay? So um, for binary flags, it doesn't really matter, as you might understand. Like, so do check, uh, so running tests, do check and do install check. These, it's a binary flag, it's either true or false. So I don't need to check the upstream definition for that. But if you're modifying another phase, post-install, pre-install, pre-configure, anything, it's a good idea. It, it saves you a lot of time to go upstream and take a look at what it was, okay? And um, with that, we're now ready to focus on Python environments. So the first one is right out of the documentation. It's so we, we have the same setup. We have used our pinned sources, always best practice. We um, define, so in the same spirit of us defining the hook in the let phase and then using the hook here, when we make our shell, okay, so there are a couple of different types of inputs. There's propagated inputs, there's build inputs, and there, there are a bunch of these defined but they're really more important for when you're building things. For make shell in particular, the only one you care about is build inputs, this one. So you have make shell, function starts here. Then uh, you call it with packages, a bit overkill, but it still works because technically you don't need with packages here, but it's fine. And you have defined these functions, these packages which you want. And you have also passed in Okay, so it, it should be clear that uh, this is basically transparently expanded here. And uh, you could imagine this in parentheses and we could have just written it here. But uh, it's easier and more readable for us to do it in this manner. Now this is great in some sense, you know, it's great when, you know, so NumPy is there in Nix and we can, we can actually check that. Yeah, so as, as you can see, there are a lot of different Python packages which have NumPy. And that's good, you know, for, for packages which exist there. But what about when it doesn't? Well, even before that, how do we make the correspondence exact? How do we make a one is to one correspondence between using a virtual environment, which if you recall, apart from Conda, which does some linking, is going to duplicate these guys. How do we how do we make this one is to one correspondence? How do we set this up so that we can duplicate packages? Not that we should, but just in case we're feeling lazy. Well, the answer is path hacking. So in our hook, if we so for example in this situation, what we're doing is we're making a little pseudo directory, a pseudo pip directory, in our uh, project directory. You should get ignore that. It goes without saying. And uh, we are simply setting our path to uh, 
both the Python part. So we're extending the Python part. This is important to note. Okay, so we are setting the pip prefix to uh, this folder, but we are extending the Python part. If you don't extend Python part, like, so extending means, uh, so for those of you who don't know this, this just re-expands. It's kind of like a recursive call if you notice. So you are basically just appending this to the existing Python part. And uh, why do we append? Because we want it. So, okay. Another word about paths is they are, um, so the first hit is the one which runs. Okay. So when you prepend something, that means you give it more precedence than the ones down in the path. Okay. So, and we need to, uh, so this is a requirement because otherwise the source, so pip requires a source an epoch date after 1980, I think. So it's just easier to unset it if then just works. And the rest of this is the same. The rest of this is the same. And here, if we run pip, then we will be able to install things and you know it just works as a normal environment with the caveat that we have now lost the caching capability, right? So while this is there, it's not really, you know, I mean, I wouldn't do it to put it lightly. Um, ah, okay, specific versions, good question. So that is all part of this part, non-standard Python. What happens when we want to do something else? And there are a couple of ways of doing something else. One of the ways is, you know, the very first one is what if I, and in fact, that's something which uh, someone just asked, what if I want to change the version? Well, in that case, you're in the realm of overrides. Similar to global overrides, and maybe you'll understand that we could have actually done this for the global ones as well. So let's break this down, yeah? Um, let's pull this out into Jamboard and stare at this. Okay, so uh, what are we doing? So, well, the first part is simple. Like this part is well known to us. We're saying that uh, our shell should contain this makepy environment. Makepy should contain Python with packages and it should contain this. But we've done something else here. This Python has been redefined here, right? Maybe yellow is better. And what did we redefine it as? We, over we overrode the default Python right? Or rather here, we've defined it to be Python 3.8. Uh, the self super thing, we, we don't need to get into. You can just, um, you could look this up, but it's not that important for us right now. It's, it's okay, for those of you who are wondering, this is just uh, part of the whole functional programming thing, because everything is supposed to be pure. Therefore, you have to, re you have to be clear about what you're referring to. So in, in this case, so the package overrides of self, which is of Python 3.8. And uh, so super refers to, you know, again, here. So you're saying uh, the PyTest, which is going to be part of Python 3.8, you are overriding a Python attribute of that. In this case, we are overriding the checks. It is equally valid to have overridden version. So that, that should answer the first question. We could have, and is this true? Let's find out. Let's go to the actual derivation. This is going to be a pain to find. That's all right. Ugh. Yeah, here we go. Uh -huh. Okay. So where is the version defined? Well, version is here. So how would we then override this? Mm, okay, yeah, very good question. So thankfully, not really. 
So what, what actually happens here is when we change the version, then it's going to note that it's actually building this, right? So, so when we rebuild this, then it's going to rebuild all the um, dependencies as well. Remember that the next uh, guarantee, if you will, is that each package is basically isolated. Um, let's go up here. Yeah, each package is isolated with its own hash. This is true even of sub packages like Python packages, okay? And so what will happen is it might take longer because you'd have to rebuild everything which would correspond to that particular version. Internally, I think it uses either the, I'm, I'm not going to commit to this, but it uses one of the Python dependency resolvers to get all the right versions. And it'll build each and every one of those and then give you the Python which you have wanted. I mean, the package which you want, okay? Uh, is that, uh, feel free to unmute yourself actually, I mean, if that would be better. So, okay, what, what I'm trying to say is in, in this particular case, if we wanted to override, maybe, maybe we should check this, yeah? Um, What's a small package which will build in a reasonable amount of time? It's not PyTest because PyTest actually takes quite a while to build. Uh, okay, let's let's just do PyTest. And uh, if I recall correctly, there's a dunder to get version, yeah? Does, does anyone remember? Um, So what version do we want? Um, what version can we get? What were the allowed versions? 5.4.2, let's, let's go with 5.4.2, yeah? Just, just for kicks. I don't actually remember this version. Aha, uh -huh. version, yes, so that, that should work. Let's... Going into a pure shell. Ah, okay, now it's going to bulk, it's going to take a while. Yeah, so, so it, it, do, you see, do you see what's happening here? Um, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll just, so because I changed the version, it's going to rebuild all of these. By the way, I'm not using Lori right now. If I had been using Lori, it would have built this in the background, but I didn't want to do that. So see, because I have demanded PyTest 5.4.2, it has decided it's going to build me all of these guys. Yeah? And it literally builds them. That's what it's going to do. And it is going to test all the other ones. I'm going to kill this. But uh, does, does that clear that up? It's a very good point, you know, it's, it's always good because th they're not always very explicit about these things to be very fair. Um, if, if that's clear, maybe put a plus one or something. Um, oh, ah, okay, question. Okay, um, I, I feel like this maybe is coming from a place of me being unclear about what, what is going on here. Um, what does it mean to have isolation in terms of packages? It, it means that, um, let me just pull that slide up again. Like, okay. So, Perhaps it's it's not clear from this, but this Firefox, for example, like I'm just going to use Firefox, but maybe maybe I'll copy this one. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, and in fact, make things even clearer. Let's imagine that I have changed this by a digit. Okay, I have changed which version this is. Then in order to get me this, I have now built, and, and you saw that with PyTest, it started building a whole bunch of other dependencies because at the end of the day, the job of Nix in some sense is to give me one Firefox, which is, so is to give me the sim linked Firefox. Now that Firefox will independently require other dependencies. And if you're wondering, how does this work? I mean, can't you break the system then? Well, of course you can break the system. If for example, I had asked for this package with this version and I demanded Python 2, it's not gonna work, it's going to crash. But, um, ah, okay, yes. So that question, uh, good question. Those are profiles. So you see these guys out here. So you'll notice that it actually doesn't link directly to you. You are here. So you start here, we start here, and each user gets a profile. And what's more, you can define different profiles as well for one person. And there you define which Firefoxes you want. In this case, you might understand, you might notice that uh, I am demanding a shell of a particular kind, yeah? So what, what I'm doing is, uh, Sorry, I don't know why that's taking so long. Yeah, finally. So here, um, the question of my profile is really a bit moot because I am actually building this shell in particular. And, and you'll notice that this now immediately ran because I, I got rid of that version. So it's not rebuilding anything. But if I had kept this version, if I had wanted a downgraded version or even, even a greater one, I don't know if this is a valid version, but let's, let's find out what's the worst that could happen. Apparently that is valid for us. Um, is it? Is it really going to build me? A... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here you go. Five point four point five. Even though that's not even that's a version higher than what it was building me by default. Okay. Now, if in case to to clarify this even further, there is some magic going on, and that magic is, uh, this actually does a call, uh, to build package through PyPy. Maybe, maybe we should go ahead with this and it will become a little bit clearer. That's the very next part. Okay. So what is this? I, I think the other part of the confusion stems from what is actually going on here? What is What does this command do? What does it mean to build things? Well, to build things, all it means is it, it is literally going to run the entire build process, be it through setup tools, which is the default actually. Um, yeah, so if you need more up-to-date dependencies, as you saw, it was just going to build them all for me and then provide me with that particular um, package which I needed. So then the question is, what is really going on? How does it do that? And in order to in order to describe that, I found a package which is not, it's not there previously. And so if you, if you just try to ask for it, um, if you just try to put it, it's going to, it's not going to work. If you just, uh, in your shell, if in your Python, if you say, give me F90 wrap, it's not going to work. So in that case, we need to build it. So we're going to call another function, this function, build Python package. And we're going to give it, again, version, name. Here's where a lot of other magic happens. I chose to fetch from GitHub with the master branch and uh, this repository. I mean, this uh, sha hash, but I could have actually instead done fetch from PyPy, in which case uh, I wouldn't need to give it rep repo or owner. I just need to give it revision and the hash. If you're wondering where do you get the hash from, uh, there's a line about this at the bottom. You can do, you can use these two helpers. So if you run this helper, next prefetch. Uh, Smaller example. That's okay. 
Yeah, so so it'll give you the hash as along with a bunch of other information. This is a helper function. There's a similar helper function for um, URLs, but uh, if, if you want my personal opinion, the easiest way is to just let the system tell you. If you give it the wrong hash, it'll give it'll error out with a message saying expected hash this got hash that. And that that's really then you just copy that. Um, but let, let's let's go into this a little more. So I have defined source. Notice the provenance of this source. I have to define everything. So there is no way I'm going to get something else because I'm I'm demanding a hash which is source like this. Okay. Now here there are more things going on. What are the things going on here? Because we're building a package. Now it's not enough to just take build inputs. So you'll notice with make shell, I told you that build inputs is all we need. Here we also need um, some propagated build inputs. I would suggest uh, going through the manual a little bit for this, but the general idea is propagated build inputs means the environment after this has been built. So build inputs mean the environment with these functions and propagated is kind of like, sure, you get the functions, but you also get the environment in which they were built. And that's important for us here. Because of the nature um, of this package, this program, I had to give it a pre-configure flag where I basically had to pass it gfortran because otherwise it couldn't find it. And I skipped the test because um, quite, quite honestly, I didn't need them in my use case. Okay. Um, I'm going to check for questions now. Um, yes, even each user can have multiple profiles, yes. And more than multiple profiles, like I don't even use profiles because I just use Nick shells. So this is the thing, you know, a lot of Nick's features, profiles and, you know, channels and all of those things. But in my opinion, the most powerful part of Nick's is just the shell, shell.nix. This is all you need to define everywhere uniquely your environment. It's project-based. You don't need to worry about the system. And because it's in Nix, you still get all the caching. So yeah, that's that's my two cents about this. There is one last thing which I'm going to discuss. And that is, what if I wanted a whole new Python? You know, um, case in point, what if I wanted Python 3.6? .6? Well, um, the solution is quite simple. When we have, okay, um, this is actually quite involved. There's a lot going on here. Not only are we overriding the packages and adding in new packages which did not previously exist here. So, so you know, this is a definition we have put here where previously we were actually overriding, we were using this override, we were saying there exists an ASC package already. So we're doing super ASC. So it's, it's like super set of the ASC existing package and we're overriding some things. For F90 wrap, we're actually building it from scratch. So as you can see, it's much longer. That's one thing you can see. And also there's no super here because it's building itself in some sense, yeah? So self here refers to Python. We, we're we passing it an argument actually. You'll notice we have, we have opted to change this a little bit. Uh, okay, I will be back in a second, just, just. Sorry, there was someone at the door. Okay, right. So, okay, many things are going on in this. So this is this is actually the most involved of all these examples. It's also the last of our examples. Um, so clearly I had to define this function, this, this entire environment, this package, I had to build it because it did not exist before. I had to do so in context of Python. And what's more here, I'm now adding the ability to override what version I'm giving it. So by default, I'm saying by default, the version is 3.8. But now my next shell can take an argument string, which takes um, two things. One is the variable and the other is the variable value. And with this, um, yeah, we, are there any edge cases which we have missed is my question now. Because we, we're able to change the Python version, keeping everything else, so um, obviously, as you might imagine, these are going to have to be changed if I change the Python version. But the rest of these don't because they typically have derivations which were built for previous versions of Python anyway. Um, 
Oh, what do you need to give your colleague? Yes, all you need to give your colleague is uh, these three files. They will need your shell.nix, okay, because that, that's super important. They will need um, your NIV files. So they will basically need, okay, let's, let's just go up here. The files that your colleagues need are just these. They will need, um, and in fact, not even the nvrc. You don't want to give it to them, you don't have to. They don't have to use Lottie. They need your shell.nix, they need your nix directory, which should contain your sources.json and sources.nix. That's all you need. Yes, wonderful. Okay, so we have, um, so the last part of this is just um, extolling the existing references so that the references here, um, there are um, the manuals, and there's the standard approach. The standard approach, if you go to the next builds, they, it's like learn functional programming, then learn how to build derivation, then finally make shell is just thrown in as an extra. It's like, oh, you know, it's also there. But to me, really, make shell is the thing. Make shell is what you can share because I can't share my derivations that easily. You know, I mean, it's it's just not that pretty. But the environment, that, that sharing the environment helps you out a lot, in my opinion. And um, there are things which I did not cover. For example, I did not cover making Docker images out of this. I, for paucity of time, you know, many things have not been covered. But I hope this was a useful introduction to all of you. And uh, thank you for your time. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Cool, wonderful. So I'm gonna sign off. I need to go check on some stuff. And uh, this is great, yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you, David and Amita and uh, the audience. Thank you, Rohit. Um, I lost, yeah. So yeah, thank you for your presentation. Thanks for the all attendees that were here. And I will save the chat and stop the recording. Uh, I don't know. I was told that there was some survey for the participants, but I don't know whether there was in a different type of session. So probably there's not any survey here to run. Oh, yeah, there is. There is one. Oh, yeah. Where is it? It's right at the top here. I'll send it in the chat here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There is a facility. Yeah, right. I didn't see what I read the whole thing this morning. So yeah, so uh, the people who are still here can fill the survey. It will be uh, appreciated. And yeah, thank you very much, Rohit, and everyone who was here. Wonderful. Thank you. Great audience, great questions, and uh, see you around. I hope you guys use next. Bye.